All right, we are back at it today and we're going to talk about uh, the detente period of the Cold War in the 1970s and the onset of what is known as the Second Cold War. So let's start with the, the reasons for detente. First and foremost, I think we've got to talk about the threat of nuclear war. As we talked in an earlier video about the nuclear arms race, by the time we get into the 1960s, both the United States and the Soviet Union are entering this, this period of, of mad, mutually assured destruction, where it is recognized that if anybody started a nuclear weapon, it could be the end of both countries. So both countries were resistant, obviously, to, to take that step. This threat of nuclear war in the 1960s is going to nearly bubble over with uh, confrontations both in Berlin and Cuba. So both sides are going to be willing to, to work together to try to reduce the risk of that nuclear threat. By the late 1960s also, the Soviet Union will largely reach nuclear parity, uh, relatively equality with the United States. So negotiations between the two on limiting their arms could at least begin on an equal footing. Now for the Soviets, their rationale for uh, detente was um, largely economic. Uh, their country was going through, through economic stagnation. Uh, Soviet standards of living were lower compared to the West. Um, and detente would allow some resources to be directed from military expenditures and building this massive nuclear arsenal to more consumer goods. Also, what could help uh, the economy is hopes of importing Western technologies. The reality was that, that Soviet industries were using outdated technologies for, for even household appliance like refrigerators and, and stoves. Um, and if they could import some Western ideas and Western technologies, that would save on resources down the road and ultimately provide more consumer goods at more affordable prices. The Soviet Union uh, also had the deteriorating relations with China, and detente with the United States could possibly, for the Soviet Union, keep China more isolated, which is kind of the same thing that the Chinese were thinking about improving relations with the United States as well. For the United States, President Nixon wants to end the Vietnam War. It is his promise in his 1968 election, and 1972's election is right around the corner. And so by having better relations with, with the Soviet Union and China, they could put pressure on the Hanoi government in North Vietnam uh, to accept the agreements in the Paris Peace Accords. We also need to talk about uh, the idea of realpolitik. This is, this is Henry Kissinger's notion of realistic or pragmatic politics, that the United States should not just be viewing the world as bipolar, US and Soviet, communism versus capitalism, that, that we need to, to handle issues as they arise on their own merits. And not every uh, uh, communist movement around the world necessarily requires a, an American military response. A hope was to create some balance between the five great economic and strategic centers around the world, the Americans, the Soviets, Western Europe, Japan, and China. And arms control for the United States could also lead to less military commitments um, and could help strengthen the American domestic economy. Again, possibly lower taxes because of less military spending might spur the American economy that was also experiencing some stagnation in the early 1970s. So what are the successes of detente? What, what agreements are made? First, um, with regard to arms agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union, and we start with the SALT agreement, the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, which follows negotiations called the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. This is in 1972, and we're going to have a number of agreements that come out of this SALT agreement between the Soviets and the Americans. First, an anti-ballistic missile treaty. We talked when we discussed the, cold, or the arms race in the Cold War that these anti-ballistic missiles, despite being defensive, actually limited the threat of, or limited the prospects of mutually assured destruction. Say if the United States had better anti-ballistic missile technology, which we did, um, then the Soviet Union could still feel threatened um, because there was no mutually assured destruction. So one of the first things off the table as these countries start to reduce their arms 
is limiting anti-ballistic missiles uh, to only two sites in their countries and limited to only 100 missiles each. An interim treaty to start to limit the number of ICBMs, those intercontinental ballistic missiles, those missiles that could go from the Soviet Union to the United States or vice versa, and submarine launched ballistic missiles. And then a basic principles agreement where both parties would agree to work diplomatically with each other if war seemed imminent, that, that a talk must be had before missiles would fly. Following the agreement of SALT I, we get negotiations for SALT II. Now, these are going to happen throughout the rest of the 1970s um, and ultimately will never be agreed upon. But there will be discussions about limiting delivery vehicles, long-range missiles, and long-range bombers, um, and banning the testing and deployment of new ICBMs. Um, though this is agreed to by American President uh, Carter and Soviet leader Brezhnev, it's never going to be ratified by the U.S. Senate because the United States sours on it following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Now, there's also detente in Western Europe or in, in Europe between East and West, um, starting in 1970 with what's known as the Moscow Treaty, when the Soviets, the Polish and the East German government will officially recognize those post-World War II borders between Germany and Poland. In 1972, a quadripartite protocol, uh, which agreed to maintain the status quo with regard to Berlin, basically providing security for West Berlin. This is between East Germany and West Germany and the United States and the Soviets. Um, in 1972, the basic treaty between East and West Germany, where each will accept their mutual existence, which they hadn't done prior to this point, and they will increase their trade links between them. And then the biggest agreement to come out of detente in Europe is the Helsinki Agreement or the Helsinki Accords. 33 nations will agree in Finland in 1975 to what is called the Final Act of Helsinki, where three baskets or categories of agreements will be, will be made. Uh, first, a security basket where European borders will be agreed to not be altered by force. Second, a cooperation basket which will bring closer economic, scientific, and cultural ties between East and West. And then finally, a human rights basket, where all signatories will agree to respect human rights and individual freedoms. Now, Leonid Brezhnev and the Soviet Union were a little bit nervous about that last basket because they've got some human rights issues. However, they definitely wanted those economic and scientific ties between East and West. So they did ultimately agree to the total package. Now, as we've already talked about, there's a detente between the United States and China as well. Uh, the United States will drop objections to China being on the UN Security Council and in the United Nations. Trade and travel restrictions will be lifted between the two countries. President Nixon will go to Moscow, or pardon me, go to Beijing and meet with Mao in 1972. And those Paris Peace Accords are signed in January of 1973 with some support coming out of the Chinese to the North Vietnamese. Now, detente is always tenuous, and many in the United States are feeling that the treaties are benefiting the Soviets more because they were the ones that lacked the, the sophisticated technologies of the Americans, um, and many in the United States did not trust the Soviet Union to follow through on their agreements. And then actions in the Middle East and Africa will indicate to some in the United States that the Soviet Union was still continuing to expand its influence there, while the US was supporting right-wing regimes in Latin America and South America. And we'll deal with uh, the United States and the Cold War in the Americas in a later video. In October of 1973, war broke out uh, following an invasion from Egypt and Syria into uh, Israel. The United States suspected that the Soviets knew in advance of Egypt's plan attack on Israel, but they did not inform the United States as they had promised to do. The Soviet Union was also involved in a civil war in Angola. The Soviets supported an Ethiopian uh, conflict against Somalia in 1977. While in the Americas, the United States supported a coup in Chile that ousted a popular left-wing leader, Salvador Allende. So even though we are in a detente period of the 1970s, this does not mean the Cold War is over.
Detente ultimately comes to an end following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. Uh, the Soviets moved into Afghanistan to support uh, a pro-Soviet government in that country uh, that was under threat by, by uh, a rebel force. To opponents of detente, this invasion of Afghanistan showed the Soviets' true intentions to continue to expand and spread their influence. SALT II would never be ratified. Exports to the Soviet Union from the West were limited and the United States withdrew from the 1980 Moscow Summer Olympic Games. Now, with regard to the historiography of detente, some will argue in the West that it was a success, that it reduced Cold War tensions, it limited the arms race, and it made the Cold War a little less unpredictable. However, the right wing in American politics considered detente a weak policy that allowed the Soviet Union to strengthen itself and gain access to Western technology without really having any costs to itself, and that Afghanistan was a proof of the failure of detente. This opened the door for the victory of Ronald Reagan in the 1980 presidential election, who would argue that the Carter administration before was showing weakness to the Soviet Union. And thus we enter into what is known as the Second Cold War. Ronald Reagan's election in, in November of 1980 uh, will follow a wave of anti-communist feelings and rhetoric in the United States and a belief that the US had to reassert their power in this Cold War relationship. Reagan argued that detente was a failure, that it offered just a one-way street, meaning the United States was cutting back, but the Soviet Union wasn't, and that they could not be trusted as evidenced by their invasion of Afghanistan. Ronald Reagan promised to develop new weapons and delivery systems, including stealth bombers, new nuclear sub-launched um, missile submarines, and uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative. Star Wars, putting, putting lasers in space that could serve as anti-ballistic weapons. Reagan also issued what became known as the Reagan Doctrine, that the United States will provide to anti-communist governments any assistance, including military, so they could stop left-wing insurgents. This was especially used in Latin America. It's kind of a return to the old Truman Doctrine idea um, and moving away from, from the Nixon Doctrine um, that uh, President Nixon had, had, had used. Uh, aggressive language also will come out of Washington, D.C. towards the Soviet Union, where Ronald Reagan will refer to the Soviets as the evil of empire, evil empire and the focus of evil in the modern world. And then uh, the Soviet Union will shoot down a Korean passenger airliner that inadvertently flew into Soviet airspace, uh, killing over 250 people. And so we see this Cold War tensions that had calmed during the detente period begin to ratchet up in the early 1980s with the second Cold War. We'll see you next time.